Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are talking about our native plants part one, but before we get started, I wanted to just take a quick minute. Maybe you're not as familiar with Teams. If you've got any questions during today's presentation, please do not hesitate to put them above in our Q&A box and our team will be happy to answer them. To get started today, though, we want to talk about native plants because it is April. And when you think April now in Ohio, you think it is Native Plant Month. In 2019, Governor DeWine signed into legislation that the entire month of April is dedicated to our native plants here. Uh, in fact, when that was done, that made Ohio the very first state to have an entire month designated to these very important flowers. And he designated them for that reason. They're very important, um, obviously not just for us, but they're very important for our pollinators. They are very important for other wildlife. They are also an important economic resource for folks, as well as just general environmental importance. So we are really appreciative to have this time. You know, we celebrate and love our native plants all year long, but they get a special spotlight nowadays in April. And to tell you a little bit about myself, though, I am Catherine, uh, Catherine Connor, and I am a naturalist at Houston Woods State Park. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, Houston Woods, we are in the Southwest District, and we're very close to Oxford, Ohio, Miami University area. And here I am very fortunate to kind of get to be a uh, Jack or Jill of all trades, if you will. Uh, being a naturalist means I get to get involved with all sorts of different things. So we are a uh, birds of prey facility. So, you know, my specialty definitely happens to be raptors, but I love everything. And one of the biggest uh, ways that I get to be involved is by partnerships. I have met so many wonderful individuals within my time here at ODNR, which has been uh, about five years, almost six years now. And I was very fortunate to uh, reach out to some folks today. Uh, well, reached out to them a while ago, but reached out and they also wanted to talk about their passion for native plants. So to start our team that we have assembled, you know me, but why don't we introduce you to Eric? Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Sagasser. I work for the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. Uh, we're one of the uh, umbrella uh, divisions under ODNR. Um, I'm a preserve manager in the Southwest District. Uh, we cover about 15 preserves down here. Some of the uh, more familiar ones would be Houston Woods, uh, Clifton Gorge, Caesar Creek. Um, most of my time is spent managing non-native invasive species so that these areas um, are, are healthy and, and future Ohioans find them um, in, in a, as good a state as we can leave them uh, and we can preserve the uh, native flora that's in there. So this this month's particularly important for our division. Um, and uh, I think that's enough about me, so I'll hand it over to Justin. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Law, and I'm a state service forester with the Ohio Division of Forestry. We are also under the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. There's 22 state service foresters statewide. We assist with private lands management with over uh, 6.8 million acres of family forest land in Ohio. We help private landowners uh, manage uh, their forest land. So if you have questions related to uh, whether you're considering a timber harvest, uh, managing your woods for wildlife, sustainability, I encourage you to reach out to State Service Forestry. You can find our contact information on the OhioDNR.gov or by calling 1-877-247-8733. And uh, I'd like to now introduce Sarah with the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Um, my name is Sarah Stankovich. As Justin said, I'm with the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Um, if you're thinking that I look a little bit familiar and maybe a little out of place here, uh, you might recognize me because I am uh, 
mostly deal with bat research. So I've done a couple webinars over the last year about uh, bats. So you may have seen me there, but I also do some pollinator work as well. So today I'm uh, happy to, to join this webinar and talk to you about uh, pollinators and wildlife. Thank you everyone for coming together today to talk to us about our native plants and the importance within our different divisions. So first of all, what is a native plant? You hear a million people say, oh, native plants. You've heard us say it a million times already. A native plant is something that is going to be in an area naturally. So it's naturally going to occur in an area. Uh, we humans have not put it there. So it is in an area that it can thrive on its own. OK, so we know what it is but let's talk a little bit more. Let's get into maybe the parts and pieces of what a native plant is. So for that, I'd like to have Eric from Natural Areas and Preserves talk a little bit about those parts and pieces. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, one of the uh, uh, <clears throat> things that I think it can really increase um, enjoyment of our natural areas um, and preserves and for that matter you know if your visit to a state park a state forest a wildlife area um, if if you are able to identify um, not only the, the animals that are there but also the plants and uh, uh, checklists for wildflowers are increasing in popularity so we wanted to hopefully give you some tools today so that while we can't teach every native plant that's out there during this webinar, hopefully you can walk away with um, some some basics to get started identifying these on your own. And so uh, we're going to do just a very brief touch on anatomy and some botanical terms to hopefully just be a little primer, get you started if you're working through a guide or what have you. Um, so. To begin on this slide, we first I state the obvious here with the petal. Uh, we're looking at the back of a spring beauty here, really the underside of a spring beauty here. So we've got our petals, which is the showy part of the flower. They make up the corolla. And then uh, to the right there, I have an arrow to a sepal, which is um, those individually form the calyx of the flower. And they're going to function in protection of that flower. So a lot of times if you come out on a, a cloudy day or kind of a cooler morning, what have you, and flowers closed up, it's, you, it's being protected by sepals there. And then looking at the other side of the flower, the, well, we've changed species here, but uh, we're looking down into the flower here. And what we're looking at is uh, one, the stamens, uh, there's six of them there. They look kind of like a foot maybe sticking out of the inside of the flower or a hockey stick or something. Um, and then the carpal uh, in the very center there. We're looking at the top down of that. And so to sort of explain that better, we have a little slide here with a cartoon flower, um, a cutaway from the side. So. The stamen is composed of a filament and an anther. The anther is basically the, the uh, top there. Um, that is where the pollen originates. And then looking at the carpal, or you might hear it referred to as a pistil, um, that's the female part of the flower. So we've got essentially a pollen tube on top of the ovary. And the ovary, a ripe ovary, um, is a fruit. Uh, so whether that be, you know, a, a dry fruit or something we'd more traditionally think of as a fruit like an apple. Um, and then obviously, again, you have your petals and sepals here. And then on to some terms here. Um, <clears throat> when you're looking through some of your guides, you might see uh, terminology regular irregular flowers. So uh, here we have a picture of a snow trillium on the left and this is going to be what we're going to refer to as a regular flower. It's kind of the classic shape. Um, it looks sort of like a daisy. All the parts are the same. For the most part if you if you divided it with a mirror you're going to get a mirror image generally. Um, so the, all, all the parts are the same and they kind of they come out of the center and they look like a daisy shape. 
Then we've got jewel weed on the other side. Um, and this is going to be one of our irregular flowers. So not all the parts are the same. Um, doesn't have the classic daisy shape. A great example of this would be if you grow peas or beans in your garden, um, the, the bean family, they are uh, uh, classically, they have a keel, a keeled petal to the flower. So that's what we would term an irregular flower. And then a little bit on leaves because this can be pretty important for ID. Um, we have various leaf arrangements here that you're probably going to have to deal with. So starting in the top left there, I have a tooth wart. And if you look at the, the leaves on the stem at their point of attachment, they encircle the stem at the same point. You see there's three of them there. We would refer to that as a world arrangement. Uh, directly under that, we have what would be termed an opposite arrangement. Uh, there's a pair there and they attach directly opposite each other on the stem. And then moving to the right, the picture in the center um, where you have an, uh, kind of an offset attachment. You see one leaf uh, kind of on the bottom left and then you come up in the picture and there's another leaf attached on the other side of the stem that would be an alternate arrangement. And then we have a situation that we would refer to as basal leaves and, and plants can have basal and stem leaves. Um, occasionally, <clears throat> some will have basal leaves only, which is where the attachment is just from the base of the plant, attachment at the ground level. And that's often the situation uh, with some of our violets as pictured here. <clears throat> and then uh, to talk a little bit about um, leaf margin terminology. So this is just looking at the very edge of the leaf. Um, so if we go back to our spring beauty, we see we have an opposite attachment. And the edge of that simple leaf is smooth. Um, there's no indentations, no cutting in of that leaf. It's just a smooth surface there. So that's going to be considered entire. Um, <clears throat> moving over to our violet again, we see the edge of that leaf has some cuts in it, sort of like a steak knife, uh, serrated. We refer to that as toothed. And then finally, uh, we have Dutchman's breeches over here on the very right. And you notice there's very significant indentations um, in the leaves there all the way back um, to the midrib. And it's actually, there's um, <clears throat> multiple leaflets. And we're gonna refer to that as divided. And that's sometimes confusing versus lobed. Um, which if you want to think of something lobed, think of uh, like your classic maple leaf shape um, where it's not going to be divided clear back to the midrib. Um, and I think that is a wrap on our terms. So I will, since we focused here mainly on um, herbaceous, I'm going to turn it over to Justin to talk a little more about uh, trees. That is right, Eric, and that is actually ties into a perfect question that came in from our Q&A box. Um, an anonymous question, which is just fine. We love all questions, but it came in. Are wildflowers the only native plant in the area? And I think you're right, Eric. I think Justin is the perfect one to put this myth to rest. Thanks, Catherine. No trees or plants too. And anatomy of trees, when we think about anatomy, we're looking at basically the structure of the tree itself. So anybody that's ever walked through the forest, we've got trees in Ohio that are, are very large plants. They can be large, small, different shapes, different sizes. 
So when we think about the structure, we need to learn to identify and become familiar what these parts are. So looking at these slides, you see leaves. Leaves are actually part of the anatomy of the tree. So what is the importance of a leaf? You think it helps identify trees, but it also has uh, the ability for photosynthesis to occur. The making of the food for the tree, the release of oxygen into the air. Other structure of the tree, the main part that supports these leaves is the branches and the twigs. They also provide movement of food uh, to and from the roots to the leaves themselves. The second part is looking at the main trunk. As a forester, oftentimes when we're walking through the woods, the trunk is all we can see. This is the main stem. The most important part as far as the transportation of water and food from the roots to the upper crown of the tree. When you look at the internal parts of the tree, you can see in the slide a cross section of this bur oak log. Of course, if you look around the outside of the tree, we have the bark. Bark is like your human skin. It's the protection of the tree from heat, moisture. Each species of trees in Ohio have different uh, textures of bark, thickness of bark, based on the species of the tree. Inside that bark, we have what they call the inner bark, which is also known as the phloem. The phloem is important for food. It's the pipeline for the tree to be able to transport food up and down the tree. Inside that phloem, there's also the cambium, which causes the, the cell uh, replication and, and lateral movement that cause that tree to grow, making bark and wood. The wood inside the tree is made up of sapwood and heartwood. And the sapwood is what moves the water up and down the tree. So you can see that light ring around the cross section. That is the sap wood, and inside the more dark color is the heartwood of the tree. The last stage I wanted to talk about in the last structure is the roots. If you look at the sketch below uh, on the bottom left of your screen, you can see that the roots oftentimes and most of the time could be found within the top 18 inches of the soil. Years ago, there would be a common uh, mistake that a lot of people would think that roots would extend very far down into the ground. That's not necessarily the case. So soil health and uh, root health are important to be able to have this tree absorb nutrients uh, to be able to survive. And with that, I would like to uh, pass it on to Sarah. Yes, thank you, Justin, for going into that. And that's the thing about our native plants here, especially with our trees and our flowers. They are going to have all these different, you know, colors and shapes. You know, the parts and pieces might be the same, but the actual petals might be a little bit different. But why is that? And for that, let's dress Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am uh, with Division of Wildlife, so I'm going to hijack this presentation a little bit and steer it in a little bit of a different direction. Um, so as Catherine mentioned, Eric's um, talked about the parts of flowers. Justin talked about the parts of trees. Um, all the flowers and trees have more or less the same parts. So looking at this um, slide here, 
why are there so many different types of flowers? You can see there's an enormous variety. Some of them are really small and inconspicuous, but others are, are large and showy. So what is it that is driving these changes? Um, and so the answer to that is something that's called pollination syndromes. So plants and pollinators have co-evolved physical characteristics that make them more likely to be able to interact successfully. So on one hand, the plants are benefiting because they're attracting a particular type of pollinator to the flower. So this ensures that the pollen is going to be carried to another flower and result in successful reproduction. And then on the other hand, the pollinator is benefiting from this adaptation because it ensures that it's able to get access to food resources. So the nectar and the pollen that the flower is producing. So the flower type, the shape, the color, odor, nectar, the structure, all of those things vary by the type of pollinator that's going to be pollinating that flower. So whether it's an animal or something else. So I'm going to talk about some of the more common pollinators and we're going to look at the characteristics of the flowers that they pollinate. And so when you think about pollinators, probably the first thing that comes to mind uh, is bees. So there's a large variety of bees, but in general, they all have really high energy needs that need to be met. So Bees are attracted to flowers that are bright white, yellow, or blue. Um, fun fact, but, uh, bees actually can't see the color red, um, but they can see something that humans can't see, and that's UV light. So many of the flowers that are pollinated by bees have this region of uh, low ultraviolet light near the center of the petal, and this is invisible to humans. It's called a nectar guide. And this guide helps the bee quickly locate the center of the flower. So you can see this in the two photos in the upper right hand corner of the slide here. On the left, um, that photo is how this flower would look to a human. And then on the right is how it looks to a bee. So you can see that really dark um, patch of ultraviolet light in the center that helps guide them right to the center of that flower. Uh, bees also have an excellent sense of smell. So they've got olfactory receptors on their antenna, their mouths, and the tips of their legs. So they're attracted to flowers that have an odor um, and usually a pleasant odor. Uh, and the shape of the flowers that bees pollinate are usually shallow, uh, sometimes tubular, and they're of course open during the day. So I've got some photos of bees on some native flowers here. That's um, blackberry, Jacob's ladder, and blazing star, just to give you an idea of some of the types of flowers that bees pollinate. And next up, we've got butterflies. Um, butterflies are less efficient than bees at moving pollen between plants. So they've got long, thin legs that hold their body a little bit further away from the flower than, you, you know, in those pictures of the bees, they're right up in that flower. But the butterfly's body is a little bit further away, and they don't have those specialized structures that bees have to collect pollen. But they will still get um, pollen on them when they're feeding on the nectar, and so the, they will move it to other plants. So they are pollinators. Um, butterflies uh, favor the flat clustered flowers somewhere that they can have a space to land um, and flowers that have abundant nectar because they also have really high energy needs. Um, unlike bees, butterflies can actually see red, so uh, butterfly pollinated flowers are often really brightly colored like the ones you see here. Um, unlike bees, again, butterflies don't have a strong sense of smell, so the flowers that they pollinate, they might have a faint scent, um, but nothing as strong as the ones that are pollinated by bees. Uh, the shape of the flowers is generally tubular, so this accommodates the long proboscis of the butterfly. And again, some photos here of some native plants. We've got butterflies on cardinal flower, uh, New England aster, and of course monarchs uh, on common milkweed. And the last animal pollinator I'm going to talk about here um, are birds, and specifically hummingbirds. So hummingbirds only weigh between 2 to 8 grams, but their hearts pump 1,200 times per minute, and their wings beat 70 times each second. So they require a lot of energy. Um, to survive, they have to actually eat several times their weight in nectar every day. So flowers that are pollinated by uh, or used by hummingbirds will have abundant nectar resources. Uh, hummingbirds actually have really good eyesight, so they're really attracted to shades of red as well as orange and white. They've got that long slender bill, so it should come as no surprise that the flowers that they feed on are long and funnel-like or cup-shaped to accommodate that bill. And this causes the bird's face to become dusted with pollen as they're drinking that nectar, and then they'll move it from flower to flower. Um, so you can see that shape I'm talking about in these uh, native flowers here, the foxglove beard tongue, uh, trumpet creeper, and then the scarlet bee balm. Um, and interestingly, hummingbirds have little to no sense of smell, so the flowers that they pollinate generally don't have uh, much of an odor at all. There's a couple other insect pollinators that I'm not going to cover just for time here. So there's flies, moths, and beetles. Um, in other parts of the world, bats are actually pollinators. But I do want to talk about one form of non-animal pollination that's really important, um, especially to a lot of our native trees, grasses, sedges, and rushes. Um, and that is wind pollination. This is also really important for things like crop plants. Um, so wheat, corn, rice, oats, um, some of the nut trees like walnuts and pecans, they're all wind pollinated. 
So photos here um, showing the wind pollinated flowers, they're really small and inconspicuous. They don't possess a scent. They don't produce nectar because they're not trying to attract any animal. Um, the stamens you can see in the photo uh, on the on the left here, the stamens are really long and they protrude out of those flowers. So again, rather than putting energy into large showy flowers or nectar, wind pollinated plants are putting most of their resources into making pollen. So they're releasing billions of grains of pollen into the air in order to increase that chance of reproductive success. Um, and unlike the sticky pollen that you're going to find in flowers that um, are adhering to animals, the pollen that's produced by wind pollinated plants is generally really light and dry. So you might be familiar with this because these are the plants that are often causing your seasonal allergies because they're producing so much pollen. Um, so it's important to know that many flowers are pollinated by a variety of different pollinators. So those ones that I showed are not just exclusively bee pollinated or butterfly pollinated in most cases. Um, uh, so it's not always going to be a one to one match, but it is really fun to learn about these suites of characteristics and how they might influence um, what pollinators are visiting a particular plant. So when you're going out and you're looking at wildflowers, just stop and take a moment to think about the shape and the color and the scent um, and make a best guess as to what types of pollinators that that flower might be trying to attract. And I think um, that'll be another way that you can enjoy going out and looking at wildflowers. Thank you, Sarah. And that's actually what I want to touch on next is why are we learning all these parts, pieces, colors, shapes? It's all different ways that we can help learn to identify these different wildflowers. So when you're out there in the woods, there is a, oh, there's so many resources out there for you guys to get to use to try to find these flowers. What we all did was we took some time, we used some of our favorite resources, and we wanted to share those with you today. So to start off with, uh, I will be covering the book that I first was introduced to when I was in college. A really popular way to help ID some of our wildflowers is going to be by using this guidebook. This is going to be your Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. And this is actually the one that I learned how to use when I was in college, so I'm a little biased, but this is the one that I always turn to. You'll really love this book because as you flip through it, maybe you don't remember all the information we told you in this uh, webinar, but what you can do is relook at all of that information, all the different types of flowers, types of leaves, all of those things that we mentioned before, but maybe might have slipped your mind. And you're gonna use all that information to look at your flower, look at this key guide, and try to figure out what you have. So why don't we take a look at this species right here. And this is going to be this nice kind of heart-shaped leaf plant. And down below is a beautiful maroon brown flower. So let's take a peek at that flower because our first question is our flower type. And as we're looking at it, we see that it has one, two, three parts. So we've got a flower with three regular parts. We have to remember that number three there. But now let's look at the plant type. What type of leaves do we have? These two big, large leaves that this plant has all start from the bottom or the base. So remember, these are basal leaves only. So that is going to be number two. So we've got a code so far of three, two. Now let's look at those leaves one more time. Do these heart-shaped leaves have any serrations or lobes on them? They don't. These are called entire leaves. So we've got two. So now our code that the book is giving us is three, two, two. So then I flip to our locator key and I have my three, two, two number. That's my group number. I'm going to sort through until I find my 322. I'm going to flip to page 116. And this is going to have flowers of all the same characteristics of our wildflower with basal leaves only and three regular parts with leaves entire. You can look at the pictures, but really go ahead and read through your descriptions. And we know, when they have a nice little sketch here, that we have wild ginger on our hands. Wild ginger is a beautiful wildflower that is a short-statured plant.
plant that the flower grows down below. And as Sarah mentioned earlier, that color is an indicator for us. That color is going to attract beetles and spiders and other kind of ground dwelling insects that help with decomposing material. If we were to sniff this flower, you would realize that it has a very stinky smell. It actually mimics the smell of rotting meat. And that is because it wants to attract those types of pollinators. So that is one easy way to help you use this Newcomb's Guide and ID our questioned wildflower at hand. All right, let's use this Newcomb's Guide to ID one more flower. And this time of year, I get a lot of questions about this. Because this little small tree or shrub is going to be seen really all over the place. It's pretty prevalent along roadways, forested edges like this. Uh, and some people even plant it as an ornamental in their yard. So it's definitely something people are seeing bloom this time of year. But what is it exactly? Let's flip to our locator page in our book. And let's take a breakdown of everything here. So as we look at this flower and we try to count our petals, we notice that there is this right here on the edge. This bottom piece is what tells me this is an irregular flower. So irregular flower means one. Let's look at our plant type. So this is not a wild flower we'd see on the ground. This is a shrub. So we'll go with number five. And that shrub or tree, this bark is going to often be a grayish brown color. When it gets a little bit older, it'll start breaking apart and being a little more kind of like plates put together. But for right now, we know this is a shrub. And then why don't we look at our leaves? We don't have any leaves right now. So we've got a number for that. No apparent leaves, number one. So we've got one, five, one from our key. Let's flip to our locator key and use that 151. And we found our 151. We need to flip to page 104. So as we scan for 104, we've got some pictures, but let's not get too thrown away by the pictures. Let's read through some of these and look. I definitely know it's not our honeysuckle. Oh, this characteristic fits. The leaves are undeveloped. At our flowering time, the flowers are these beautiful rose purple colors. Uh, and we know that these are going to be our red bud. Now there's a picture over here of our sketch of a red bud and that gives you a little look at what the leaves will look like when they come out here in just a few, maybe weeks to months. But those leaves are going to be entire. They are not gonna have any serrations on the edge and they are heart-shaped, so they are one of my favorites. But red buds are a really beautiful flower. They are pollinated by some of our longer-tongued bees, so carpenter bees, uh, blueberry bees, there's a lot of different types of bees. But one of the fun things about red buds is when I was in school, my friends and I would go around and collect the flowers because they are sweet to put on our salads. Red buds, if you're collecting from a area, are edible, whether cooked or raw. So go out, ID that plant, and maybe give it a taste. I can hear the bees above me helping pollinate this beautiful tree. Newcombs is my go-to field guide, but there are several other ways that you can get out in the field and ID your flowers. A really popular. So we've been discussing using field guides and references to aid in the identification of wildflowers. And uh, another approach that can be used in plant ID, if you're approaching an unknown specimen, is to use family characteristics to aid in identification. So we're gonna run through an example of that in this particular reference, a field guide to wildflowers by Peterson and McKinney. And so if you'll notice at the beginning, there is a section that describes family characteristics. In this case, um, we'll approach this plant here. 
And as you'll notice, there's quite a few of them. And so I noticed that the description for the purslane family fits this plant. And so I'll read you the description here. It says small plants, two sepals, which I find two sepals here. Um, five petals. We have five petals. Leaves opposite. And our leaves are arranged opposite. And so I come back to my description. Um, it fits the characteristics mentioned. And then I see here that it says to reference page 32 in the case of a white flower. Now this flower sometimes will be more pink as well, but often there's uh, just dark pink stripes on the white flower. So we're gonna proceed to page 32 here. And so I go to page 32. And from here, they actually give illustrated descriptions. And I find that what we're looking at is spring beauty. And there are uh, more identifying characters given on this page to separate them out from other plants of similar description. And so we'll move on to one other example here. I think this will be a good specimen for us to approach. And so in this case, I have a flower with four petals that are arranged in a, a cross pattern. So to me, I'm immediately thinking mustard family. And we'll come to our book here. And this describes the mustard family. Um, four petals in the shape of a cross, six stamens, two usually shorter. In this case, you would really want a hand lens to help you check on that description because of the size of the flower would be difficult to see unaided. Um, and then, so we continue with our description here. So I say it fits based on the characters given for that family. And this directs you to pages 82 to 86 for a white flower. So I'll follow this back to page 82 to 86. And then we have an illustration that helps me determine that this is cut leaf toothwort. And then again, here we have more identifying characters that help us correctly identify this plant to the species, um, describes the environment it typically likes to be in, rich moist woods, bottoms, and its range. Your reference is much more than five to 10 years old. Chances are that Plants may have moved to different families. A lot of that is due to DNA and how we're categorizing plants these days. So things that are evolving rapidly in that sense, but this can still be a helpful approach. I encourage you to download this wonderful field guide, Trees of Ohio. You can download this on the Ohio Division of Wildlife webpage. If you're learning how to identify trees, this could be a great resource. This book outlines 69 different species of trees found in Ohio. If you're a beginner and don't know how to identify trees, let me give you a, a couple pointers. First, let's start with the phrase mad buck. You're probably thinking to yourself, Mad buck? Is there a lot of mad bucks running around Ohio? Well, that may or may not be the case. But mad buck can be an easy way for you to start to learn how to identify trees in Ohio's forest land. So what does mad buck stand for? Let's start with maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeyes. If you're probably here in Ohio, you've heard of the Buckeye. So let's take a look. As we approach this young tree, we're looking at certain characteristics. We see a small branch here. Anything that is in the maple, ash, and dogwood, and Buckeye group, it will have opposite branching an opposite leaf arrangement. So what does that mean? 
Let's look at this main stem. These branches come off opposite of each other. Could this be an indication that this is a maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye? Let's look at another characteristic. Here's a young leaf. Let's look how these leaves come off of the branch. Does that look opposite to you? It sure does to me. Now, let's look at this leaf shape. Does this look familiar to anyone? I'm sure we have some Ohio State Buckeyes fans out there today. This leaf shape is described as palmate. Palmate means kind of like the shape of your hand. The buckeye is common to Ohio's wet forests along waterways. It's a small understory tree that you can find prolifically in the southwest and eastern part of the state. As we scan this forest, we notice a multitude of other trees. Do any look familiar to you? As we approach this large tree, you're probably thinking, I have no idea what this is. Well, let's think of the basics. Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye. As we approach the branches, we also see something very characteristic. Do those branches look to come opposite of the stem? Yes, similar to the buckeye we just looked at. Could this be a maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye? Any guesses? Let's look closer at some of the leaves. Here's a small branch that has small leaflets coming out. This leaflet is simple in its shape. While these are small and juvenile leaves, this is characteristic of the silver maple. Other characteristics of silver maple involve the seeds. Silver maples have samaras. Samaras are seeds produced by the maple tree. These are samaras from the silver maple tree we just looked at. These little seeds blow in the wind like small little helicopters. My kids like playing with them too, and wildlife like squirrels like eating them in the springtime. Last, let's look at one other tree in the mad buck group. As we look at this sapling in the understory, notice the characteristic opposite branching. These branches come off opposite of the main stem, similar to the buckeye tree we looked at earlier. Now let's look at the leaf shape. Notice these small leaflets in a row with the terminal leaflet at the end. This is small and juvenile, but this leaf shape is described as pinnate. This is characteristic of ash trees. Also notice how the leaf come off, comes off opposite of the stem. Do you see a pattern here? Maple, ash, buckeye, all have opposite branching and opposite leaf arrangement. So if you're a little bit more tech savvy or maybe you don't want to carry around books or field guides when you're out hiking, it probably comes as no surprise that there are apps on your smartphone that will help you identify things as well. So we're going to go through just a couple of those right now. So the first app that we're going to talk about is iNaturalist. This is probably the most popular one. So when I open up iNaturalist, yours might look different if you're just starting an account, but because I've used the app before, I've got some observations in here already. 
but basically um, what you can do is tap on this plus button in the lower right hand corner and you can either um, take a photo or you can choose an image if you've already taken a photo. So I'm going to take a photo of this plant here. Hit OK. And then I can tap this first thing here that says, what did you see? And this is going to bring up some suggestions of the species um, that this might be. So here we go. It's telling me that this is most likely in the genus um, uh, the winter cresses. And it gives me a couple suggestions here. Um, you can see there's a lot of plants that look fairly similar. So um, if I want to, I can stop there. I don't necessarily have to publish this to the site. But if I want to go ahead and add my observation, I'm going to just choose winter cresses because I'm not sure which one this is. I'm going to select this. And then there's some other information that I can fill out as well. Um, the date and the time that I saw it, the location, uh, whether it's a captive uh, specimen or not. And then I can just hit the, the check mark here and upload this. One of the interesting things about iNaturalist is that other people are now able to see my observations here and they can come in and say whether or not they agree with what I've called something or not. So obviously because I just published that winter crest one, um, nobody's going to have seen that yet. But let me go to this blue dasher that I had previously identified. Um, and if I look at the comments section, you can see I just identified it to um, the dragonflies because I didn't know what it was. And some other people have come in here and um, added their identification that it's a blue dasher. So um, if you just identify something to the genus or even um, higher up than that, other people can come in and help you fine tune um, your identification. So you don't have to do that. If you don't ever want to publish your photos, you don't have to. You can just use that what did you see um, feature to give you an idea of what you saw. But if you uh, would like to publish your photo, then other people can come in and help you figure out what it was. The next app I'm going to talk about is one called Leaf Snap. So let's go ahead and open that up. So similar to iNaturalist, I can either take a photo or I can choose one from my gallery. So let's go into gallery and I took a photo. There it is. <laughs> I took a photo of the leaf from that plant that we were just looking at. So now it's going to ask me what is that photo? Is it a leaf? Is it a flower? Is it a fruit or is it bark? So let's choose leaf and see what happens here. This one has a couple ads in it, so you have to close that out. Um, but great, it's bringing up um, plants in that same genus, that winter crust genus, um, as when we did it in iNaturalist. So um, we can be pretty sure that this flower that we have is at least in that genus. And then we can scroll through and look at some of the suggestions and see um, what we think this might be. So the last app I'm going to talk about today is the Google Lens app. This one's probably the easiest to use, so I'll just tap this lens button here to open it, and it's going to go straight to my camera. So I can focus on what I want to take a uh, photo of, and then tap this magnifying glass button to search. And basically what this is doing is doing a Google search for me. So I can scroll up and look at the results that it brought up. And so here um, it's bringing up a Wikipedia page for some plants in the Wintercrest genus. So we've gotten that genus across all three of our apps now, so we can be pretty certain that this plant belongs to that genus. Um, and then you can scroll down and look at some other search results that it's brought up and explore those links to try to identify the plant further. So there's obviously a lot of features in those apps that I didn't cover today, and there's a lot more apps out there. So spend some time in the app store for your phone looking at different um, apps trying them out, seeing which ones work best for you. Keep in mind, um, they might not get you all the way there. They might just kind of give you an idea of where to start uh, in your field guides when you get home. But if you have a genus or you have um, somewhere else to start, it can be more helpful than just starting from scratch. So I absolutely loved all of those videos that we put together. Uh, I hope you guys did too, and hopefully you've got some new uh, tricks up your sleeve to help you identify your flowers. But what you might have noticed about each of those videos is we were all out on the trail. So you might have flowers in your backyard, but what these native plants and native plant month has really started to promote is IDing flowers as a recreational opportunity. It gets folks outside, it gets you walking, it gets your mind sharp, and really has you questioning what's all around you. So we've got some wonderful recreational opportunities for you guys that we'd love you to come check out here in Ohio. To start off with, I have to talk about our Ohio State Parks. We have 76 
state parks for you guys to get to come and visit. And what's wonderful about these is they're all different. Every park has their special niche and special parts about it. The neat thing though, and always keep in mind when you go to an Ohio State Park, is Ohio is one of few states that still has our skate parks as being free for you guys to enter. So you guys can come out any day of the week, get to see some beautiful trails, and you can hike, you can bike. Um, some places have bridal trails. You know, the means of you being out on the trail, you know, not too, too important, but you getting outside, enjoying our state parks is what we're all about. There are some other opportunities though within the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And why don't uh, why don't we have Eric talk about what DNAP has to offer? Thanks, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> DNAP has some of the finest remaining examples of different habitat types throughout the state. Um, and that's really what we're about preserving uh, some of these gems that that are still existing in excellent condition and uh, a lot of our time goes to making sure that non-native plants don't degrade these, these areas so that you can come out and enjoy them um, as we find them today. So some of the, uh, some really good opportunities in my area for wildflower viewing would be at uh, Clifton Gorge, Caesar Creek Gorge, Houston Woods, and Gallagher Fen, but we have uh, 138 state nature preserves scattered throughout the state. And uh, most of these are really going to have excellent opportunities for viewing native plants, whether that's uh, spring wildflowers or summer, what have you. So, and I think we have also on our PowerPoint here um, our newly released native spring wildflower checklist. So hopefully you can get some enjoyment out of that. You can download that from the Natural Areas and Preserves page um, from OhioDNR.gov and uh, check out our spring bloom reports. Uh, they're released weekly, uh, give detailed information about what's in bloom around the state right now and uh, the specific preserves in some cases where you can find those. In addition to Department of Natural Areas and Preserves and Parks, we also have 24 state forests located uh, in the state of Ohio. Uh, it's over 200,000 acres uh, that the Division of Forestry manages. We have recreational opportunities with backpacking trails, uh, whether you're into horseback riding or you're into riding ATVs. There are ATV trails located on some of the state forests. So if you're really wanting to get out and explore some of uh, the best forest land in Ohio, I encourage you to get on our website, ohiodnr.gov. There's individual brochures for each of the forests available, and there's something for everybody here in the state. So last up here, we've got um, Division of Wildlife Properties. So our properties are called Wildlife Areas. Um, these properties provide critical habitat for game as well as for threatened and endangered species. So they give Ohio residents the opportunity to uh, engage in recreation like bird watching, hunting, and fishing. So you might be familiar with some of the more uh, popular wildlife areas, especially this time, McGee Marsh uh, for bird, watch bird watching. But um, there's more than 100 wildlife areas in Ohio, and that totals over 200,000 acres. So these properties can vary in size from as few as four acres to more than 1,500. And you can see the map here. Um, I put some pictures on some different slides here, but to show you a photo, uh, some photos of some of the wildlife areas, we've got a variety of different habitats. Um, there's grasslands, wetlands, forests, um, as well as cliff lines, lakes, uh, everything in between. So we know that wildlife areas can be a little bit intimidating to people because there's um, there's few trails, they're, they're rather primitive, they don't have facilities, um, and you need to be aware of the public hunting rules as well. 
If you have any questions before you go to a wildlife area, um, please call 1-800-WILDLIFE or call the district office. Um, our staff's happy to help address any concerns that you might have before visiting these places. So one of the benefits of wildlife areas is that they're not as heavily trafficked as some of the more developed parks and trails. So it's a great opportunity to um, get out and have some recreational opportunities with fewer crowds. Thank you everyone and Sarah just said it great opportunities and that's what we have here in Ohio for you guys is a variety of free right at your fingertips opportunities and this is another one. This is something that the division or the department excuse me has put together for you guys. It is a free downloadable app to your smartphones uh, or you can just look at it on your web uh, on your computer. It's a website as well, but this is going to be our trails detour app. So what this is going to help you do is figure out where you want to go. This is, like I mentioned, a free app that you can use. You can punch in your park. You can punch in if you know the trail name that you want to go to. Boom, which is what I did the other day. I knew for a fact here at Houston Woods that Blue Heron Trail is notorious for its wildflowers. I put it into my detour app. It came up with all sorts of information like where the trailhead is, where there might be some restrooms around. Maybe there's some trails that are adjoining or adjacent to it that I might want to hike afterwards. This app is such a wonderful resource for folks to use and it's you know, not just ODNR properties. What the neat thing about this app is and what we're fortunate to do is we have partnered with all of Ohio all different types of trail systems from county parks to metro parks are all getting together to send in their information to log it into this app for you guys. So there are thousands of different uh, trails on there right now. There are over 20 different areas put on there. So not just our, our forested areas, our parks. Just take a peek at it. It is worth your time and hopefully you guys can stick around and check that out and get out and enjoy our beautiful wildflowers this time of year. Before we conclude though, I want to tell you guys that this is a two part series. So if you had fun today, uh, join us next week, maybe tell a friend. We have got a second part all about, so kind of part one was getting the parts and pieces, showing you what we have to offer. Next is what you can do. So how do you kind of, manage your property for these native plants. How do you plant native plants that would be good for your area? What can you do in your own backyard and within your property to make uh, your woods a little bit better? But before we conclude, we have some great questions in our Q&A box. And the very first one I think would be perfect for Eric. Uh, the question was, you had a picture of jewelweed up on there and it asked, can jewelweed help prevent poison ivy? Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so the, I guess there's a, there's some nuance in that question I'd have to address. Prevention, I, I don't know that I could say anything about that. There is this uh, a popular idea that jewelweed will prevent the, or I guess in a sense, yes, prevent the rash. Um, the only scientific literature I could ever find on this said there was no statistical difference between jewelweed and distilled water. That's not to say I did some sort of exhaustive literature search on this, but uh, not to my knowledge, although that's a popular idea. Um, I should also say I, no, uh, poison ivy can be quite frustrating when we encounter it. Um, it's a member of the cashew family and they are notorious for having these little resin ducts that um, is actually where the uh, your shield oils come from that we have issues with. Uh, poison ivy is great bird food. Um, and I know it can be quite frustrating. And I also would caution that um, anytime we're talking about using plants for for some sort of purpose like that, always be very careful. Uh, plants are amazing. They, they cannot get up and run away from things like we can. They're stuck in whatever spot, um, you know, they, they're germinating at. So many of them are, are in fact really potent um, chemical producers. So I'd always urge caution with that because that's one, one mechanism that they will use to defend themselves is, uh, is basically uh, producing defense chemicals. So 
always be very careful about that. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Our next question I think would be perfect for Sarah, and that is uh, talking about plants in a small area. What types of flowers might we recommend for planting in containers? Yeah, so really any type of native plant that you'd put in a normal garden uh, is fine for a container garden. So I was looking at the Missouri Botanical Garden website and they had a really fun uh, formula, I guess, for container gardens and they called uh, they called it thrillers, fillers, and spillers. So you want some from each of that category. So some of the thrillers they mentioned that are native plants to us, um, those red cardinal flowers that I was showing uh, in the butterfly slide, that purple um, blazing prairie blazing star, um, cone flowers are really popular, rattlesnake master. So anything that's big and showy is going to be your thriller flower. Uh, and then fillers, you're going to want some kind of grass or sedge. Um, and then for spillers, obviously that's something that's going to spill over the container. So that wild ginger that Catherine was showing uh, is considered a spiller, um, also some phlox species. So if you're looking for resources about native plants, there is a website, um, Ohio Native Plant Month, I think it's .org, but you can just Google Ohio Native Plants. <laughs> um, and they've got a great uh, PDF where it shows you the, um, the species, what habitat it likes, it tells you the pollinators, it tells you the color. It's an amazing resource and also the um, ODNR, the DNAP, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. If you go to odnr.gov and just search um, native plants, it'll take you to the DNAP site and you'll get a bunch of native plants uh, lists by habitat type. So really any type of native plant is going to do great in a container garden. Just think about um, having a little bit of different varieties in there. Thank you so much, Sarah. And yes, not only do we have our own month, but Ohio Native Plant has its own website. The last couple questions I think would be perfect for Justin and I think that's because people you know it, it started buzzing when Justin started talking because I bet they didn't think they were going to get to learn about trees today but the very first question Justin is once a leaf falls do they release oxygen do they go dormant and stop that process or are leaves still acting in some role So I think the question was after deciduous leaves fall, do they still uh, produce oxygen? And that that's a that that's a great question. Uh, I do not believe that is the case. You know, I mean, once those leaves are fallen, they are not actively producing oxygen. Thank you. And then the very last question, and this is a pretty specific one. So we talked about the bark as identifying characteristics. Do you have any tips about how to use that? Because being a beginner without leaves, these folks kind of struggle to know which tree they're looking at. And they're particularly asking about any bark tips for elm trees or oak. Well, I think the bar characteristics are with with elm in particular sponge like bark that almost is spongy in its texture. Uh, it's very unique and soft. Uh, you can books and ID books can be great and there's a variety of pictures even with that ODNR Division of Wildlife Tree book. It's got some pretty good pictures of of bark types. There's also a variety of other uh, uh, pictures on our ODNR website of individual trees. The main thing is uh, uh, as you get it out into the woods and you notice different characteristics of trees, you'll you'll learn to identify some of these uh, and one thing if you're interested in too is to call a forester you know if you've got woods or property that we can walk around and help you kind of look at some of these features and learn to identify them uh, and oak trees in particular there's a variety of different bark patterns uh, depending on red oak or white oak groups and age and bark patterns can change with the size and the maturity of trees. 
So it takes a little bit of time. One picture might be great uh, for a certain age of a tree, but if it's young or in different size, it could be a little bit trickier to pinpoint what exactly that species is. Well, that's a great question. And it, it, it's always, even for foresters, we can be confused if a tree is uh, 200 years old and there's just not a lot of characteristics that are common uh, that can sometimes fool you. Thank you, Justin. And that is, you've touched on some really great points I wanna end on. One that you just concluded with, it takes time. It takes time to learn all these flowers and trees and plants and parts and pieces, but take that time. I really encourage you guys to take use and like we've all touched on today, there are so many resources out there for you guys. You just have to reach out and get a hold of them. Use that detour app, use the nativeplantmonth.org, ohionativeplantmonth.org, and use ohiodnr.gov. I bet you guys didn't realize that uh, you have a bit of property. A forester will come out and help walk that with you. There are so many resources out there within ODNR. We are truly here to help serve our visitors and viewers. So we really hope you join us for next week. We've got a link in the Q&A box, but we will see you next week.